Can you just go out to the Babylon Bee? <laughs> it's just they got about a minute worth of them talking and doing ads at the end of it, so I, I clipped it down so I didn't have to watch that. Just go out to the Babylon Bee and search for War on Christmas. I will not give up. <laughs> I will not surrender. Yeah, we got, we got plenty of time this morning. This is worth it. <laughs> yeah, I've already showed Jake. He, he liked it. I'll just do a plug. If you guys aren't, aren't uh, aware of the Babylon Bee, it's the greatest satire site ever. I mean, it has left the onion so far in the dust, it's not even comparable anymore. It just is. Even Elon Musk who is not a believer by any stretch of the imagination, is plugging the battle on B. <laughs> we got this? Not yet. <sighs> what about not the B? They're not a satire site. Are you sure? I wish they were a satire site. What's, what's that mean? Satire? Yeah. Uh, satire is a form of humor where we take something and we do a caricature of it or we, we uh, have humor that's somewhat based on reality but a little bit of a 90 degree angle at it. A lot of times exaggerated. A little, yeah, exaggeration. Sure. Yeah, it's pretty sad when you can't tell satire from reality, and that's kind of not the B for me. I'm like, is this sad? What? Sorry, guys, we're having technical difficulties. That's good, thank you. I've, Such good practical advice. I mean, yeah, especially that last one. Build a cake to blot out the sun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I feel better now. Jake, Jake's reading a book called uh, Something About the Humor of God, and he keeps talking to me about it. I'm like, I, I pretty much have a website that explains the humor of God to me. It's called the Babylon Bee. <laughs> But uh, I'm waiting. I, I, I'm really I'm looking forward to the message on that. I have long been a proponent of saying God has a great sense of humor. Yeah. Um, it just doesn't make sense he would have joy and create us with senses of humor and not have one himself since we're made in his image. Right. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. Last I checked, I don't think the demons or the devil have a sense of humor. And I think that's a... And if you think about it, most it's the crabby people that don't. Yeah. And I don't want to be one. Yeah. I want to be a crabby people. All right, so you ready, guys?
I'm going to start. Did you get a good laugh out of that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So last time on Cornerstone Lake Country, uh, we talked about having a clear vision, right? And I think I gave you like three readings of Proverbs 29, 18. The King James one is the most famous, where there is no vision, the people perish. Uh, the more modern translation says, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. And when it's talking about vision, it's not talking about whether you're wearing glasses or contacts and can see stuff. It's whether you have a prophetic vision for your life. Um, if you don't have an understanding of what God's sending you and what, you, what your purpose is, then you just kind of wander aimlessly and do whatever, because why not? You don't have anything you're doing. Uh, and then we came into... Two things that can, can blur your vision. One is a distraction. And for that, I found 1 Corinthians 7.35. And this is Paul is talking to the Corinthians, and he's going through whether you should get married or not get married or whatever. And he says, so if you let your kids get married, you haven't sinned. But if you don't, that's even better. That's what I think. And I'm like, I'm glad that's what you think. I know you're a man of God, but Jesus himself said that teaching is only acceptable to certain people to whom it's given. I'm not one of them. Yep. <laughs> I have 15 kids. <laughs> I'm, I'm decidedly not one of them. <laughs> um, if you are, great. And we'll support you in that. But, but in that... Uh, set of instructions, Paul, Paul said this. He says, I'm not, I say this for your benefit, not to put a strength on you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. And so undistracted devotion would have an opposite, and that would be undevoted distraction. Um, so distraction is one of those things that can get your vision blurred, and you just kind of don't see what God, where God's putting you, you don't have a direction, you don't understand what your purpose is, you're just kind of distracted by your cell phone, or the uh, Packer game, or NASCAR, or you know, struggles at work, or what, whatever it might be, it can become a distraction to you. Even good things can become a distraction. Um, you know, stuff, there's nothing actually wrong with it, can become something that consumes your time. You become addicted to movies or whatever it might be. And, and it becomes a distraction from, from Jesus. And it's just like, whatever, don't do that. Let habits run you to do things that habits are good for, like wash your hair. Um, but use your mind to worship God and keep your eyes focused on Jesus. All right. Then the other thing that can get you off of your vision is getting entangled by sin. And that's in... Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 3. I'm not going to read that. And then I gave you a little bit of, of my story, and I think I got up to about the time I got married. <laughs> so, and didn't give you a whole lot of details. I did mention um, that I got radicalized in college, I think. Right? And that on my way from one math class to another, one of the students who was in my class, her name was Christy, she handed me a bumblebee yellow flyer. Let's put the bumblebee yellow flyer up there. We haven't got the PowerPoint running yet. Because all I can see is the, the screen in the back with uh, the wood background. There we go. There it is. That's an actual scan of the flyer. And you can read it. It's September 7th, and it's hand crossed out, and it's 14 up in the Beef Eaters room of uh, Memorial Union, we're going to hear a guy by the name of Bob Weiner come in and preach. And that's the flyer that I got handed on the Madison campus uh, by Christy Kirst with the amazing evangelical training that she had. And she, I remember I, I told you her presentation, right, where she just took that flyer here. <laughs> it's amazing. You couldn't, I mean, it's a gift. <laughs> so now you've seen the Stallone flyer, Rambo. Can you? Will you survive as a Christian on this campus? And that was that was it. And then I read it, and the Lord said to me, um, 
as you recall, I, I had been praying that weekend and was crying, said, Lord, if this is real, I got to be all in. You got to have a church here. If it's not real, I'm out. But I, I, need, I need to find radicals in this city. People blow buildings up in Madison. There's got to be radical Christians here, too. And that was my answer. And, and I said, okay, thank you, Lord. Is this it? And he says, you go to this and you keep your mouth shut. And I went, yes, sir. And that's the first, I can say God clear, clearly spoke to me <laughs> uh, that I can recall. I mean, there may have been some other stuff when I was a kid, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, so I went to that meeting, and sure enough, it was crazed. And there were people there that, you know, sang and danced and lifted their hands, all the stuff Jake was talking about this morning. And, and uh, was... Uh, was different than my previous encounters with the charismatic movement in that they actually really seemed to know their Bibles. Um, I didn't get a lot of the, I didn't get the, the crazy speeches that I'd gotten from others and, and uh, still a lot of things I knew that they were just whacked on except uh, the Lord had been very clear, keep your mouth shut, so I kept my mouth shut. And a lot of what I thought was a little bit goofy turned out after further review, since it is Sunday, I'll make the the reference to the uh, call being overturned. No, I, on further review, I just didn't have a context for it, and my experience was lacking not, not what was actually being done. So that I figured out over the course of several months and years, but uh, that was something. Well, I don't think I barely got into the rest of the story. So... I, I plugged into this church, which was Maranatha Campus Ministries. And uh, you can get rid of that, please. That, that, that distracts me. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just black out the screen if you can. I'm just staring at this message. Are you distracted? <laughs> <laughs> um, what? <laughs> what were we talking about? <laughs> So uh, I, I told you about my engagement to Kathy. What I didn't tell you is that she had turned out to be uh, the roommate of this Christy who handed me the flyer, which was kind of cool. That didn't mean anything at the time. That was back in 86. We got engaged in 88, right? 88, married in 89. And it just was kind of cool that the two of them were roommates Christy was a math major, which was one of my majors. Kathy was a German major, which was the other of my majors. And uh, <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there that's probably got no... She was married to Sean Snacky, who was... That's right. And then, then just to connect a few more dots, uh, Christy married Sean Steinke. Sean Steinke is Annie Fisher's younger brother. Um, so there's a lot of interconnection that goes back to those early days in Madison and... And uh, I don't know. Sean and Christy don't come around here, so that's more for my information, just so I've said it. Uh, but that changed my whole life. I mentioned I got filled with the Spirit after a few months, went to a new members class, and, and uh, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit um, after fighting struggling, trying to work through it, um, wrestling with um, years of teaching versus what was in the Bible versus what these guys were saying. And I, and, uh, I have a, a tendency, and I'm just going to tell you right now, my tendency is if somebody says something that's wrong, I tend to discount their whole line of reasoning. And uh, it's called throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I have had to learn that's not the best approach, and I can reject something without rejecting the whole process. You go, okay, well, um, this isn't right, but maybe they just got one piece wrong. I should still listen to the rest of what they had to say. Because there were a few things in there that I still, I'd look at today and go, yeah, I don't know about that. Um, so it was a struggle for me, especially 
uh, coming right out of college and um, trying to be rigorous with my thinking and trying to be accurate in interpreting what the Bible said and, and you know, it would go a little bit this way or that way. And, and it was a real fight for me, but I finally yielded, got filled with the Spirit, and, and it really changed the whole course of my life. Um, after I did get married, uh, we were, we got engaged in 1988. Uh, Kathy's taking notes. This is so funny for me because she like lived through this. <laughs> Uh, it was Maranatha Campus Ministries. As we came to the end of 1988, uh, Maranatha. 89. Was it 80? No. 89, they just ended. Um, it's okay. It was after we got married. Was it? Right there. Yeah, I think you're right. It was the end of the year. No, they were already disbanded. Okay. okay. So somewhere in there, 88, 89, I know we got engaged when it was Maranatha Campus Ministries. Um, but Maranatha did something that organizations never do. They said, we're too big, we have too much top-down control, we need to dissolve and return the control of the local churches. And we went, what? Because <laughs> the way it had been run is um, you had your leadership group. You had, um, I won't get everybody, but you, you had the, the big three that I remember were Bob Weiner, who was president, uh, Joe Smith, who was the vice president. Bob was an apostle. Joe was prophet. Rice Brooks. I think he was eventually recognized as an apostle as well and uh, uh, several others, the names of whom kind of escaped me. And then they would do a regular board meeting with all of the lead pastors in the various churches. And we had over 100 churches across the U.S. and in various nations around the world, including Munich. I believe I mentioned last, last time uh, Kathy heard God speak to her about me. She was in Munich, Germany. She was actually living with a family in the, that was part of our church in the Munich area at the time as their nanny. At least that was yep. the plan, right? And then, um, so that was, was kind of cool. So we had this, this big organization. They dissolved it. And so here we are. Um, we were... When, when they decided to dissolve, I th I'm not sure if we were married. We were about to get married. We had just gotten married. But somewhere in there, um, there in 88, 89, everything dissolved. They officially dissolved. And they had one final thing at the end of the year down in San Antonio. And that was kind of the, okay, we're done. Everybody's free. Um, I remember it was a weird meeting um, because a there were a lot of people there that didn't get what it meant. No, no, we're disbanded. They're like, whoa, okay, so we're disbanded. We're going to form something new. <laughs> it's like, and no, we're not. And, and there were a few groups that kind of said, well, we, we have a good relationship, but we're going to hang out and stay Maranatha and, and do that. Others split into independent churches, so there were some littler streams that formed and it was, it was amazing. I've never heard of any other group voluntarily doing that. I've heard of places blowing apart because of sin and the leadership or something like that. That wasn't it at all. That wasn't it at all. It was just, they just said, you know, we're too big. We're becoming a denomination. We don't want to be a denomination. We want to be effective in preaching the gospel. And the way to do that, what works in Gainesville, Florida, is not necessarily what's going to work in in. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri, or Madison, Wisconsin, or Minneapolis, Minnesota, or New York City, um, those, those local churches need to be free to hear what God's saying to them. And so we all got released. And out of that, Cornerstone Church of Madison, Wisconsin, Incorporated, was formed. And uh, we put together a blueprint 
of God's plan for us, which we desperately need to redo for where we are today. Um, and, and just make it be what we, where we're at today, because that one said, you know, at the time it was perfectly accurate. We're focused on university towns because of, we believe that the future leaders are coming to the university, international students are coming to the university. Uh, we want to reach them. We want to be an apostolic and prophetic church like Antioch where we've got people coming in from all over the world. We reach them, train them, send them out. And, and that, was, that was the vision. We were there in Madison. It's a perfect mixing place for that kind of stuff. Um, we don't have a lot of that here, it, like right here. So we probably need to adjust a little bit on that. So, um, yeah, it's on the to-do list. And it'll eventually get done, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but that was super exciting, super scary, super cool. What are we doing? Because we were a church of about 20, maybe. Help me out here. We met in the living room, I guess. What, were, were we not at the basement of Stein Medical yeah. at this point? 20 to 30, including kids. Right. <laughs> Fisher's kids. <laughs> Fisher's had kids. Um, yeah, we, we didn't have any kids yet. Fisher's probably had three. Ken and Mary had a couple of kids. Nancy and Randall. Uh, Dunstan's didn't have kids by then, did they? Yeah, so we were, we were, we were small. It was mostly young families. Um, but super exciting, because now we were going to do something and so this is, the, this is the environment in which my family started, which is what I'm telling you. So for me, it's always, from the, from the very beginning, the foundation of, has been something new, something on the, the cutting edge of what God is doing. And I don't know how I became a suburbanite, but it, I hate it. I hate not, I haven't been out of the country for over two years and I'm like losing my mind. <laughs> um, get a little stir crazy. <laughs> Jake helped me. He took me, to, took me to the Custer State Park out in South Dakota a year and a half ago. And I found out how twitchy he is about his toothbrush. <laughs> I already gave you a new toothbrush. Yeah, but you gave it to me before Christmas. It doesn't count. And I just gave you those, I just gave you those, uh, what you call it, soft picks. Yeah. What I really should do is get you toothpaste. Yeah. Okay, do you want the actual story? Should I just tell everybody in the church what happened? I suppose that'd be less. So, I, I was in the, we were in a hotel, it's in the bathroom. I grabbed a toothbrush, which I thought was mine. I grabbed the toothpaste, and I'm squeezing the toothpaste out on the toothbrush and went, my toothpaste isn't this full. And so I rinsed it off, and I walk out to, to Jake, and I'm like, this yours? And he goes, yeah, why? Did you use my toothbrush? I'm like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so later when he was... Uh, not paying close attention, I grabbed his toothbrush from in front of him, ran into the bathroom, ran the water on it, <laughs> shook it out and brought it back, and I'm like, I might have used your toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> so this has become a running joke now for the last, what, year and a half? Yeah. <laughs> but what, toothbrush. Yeah. But, <laughs> no, but he's the one who throws it in a single cup in the restroom. Did you use it? He didn't use it. I did use it. He didn't use it. I had it in my hand with toothpaste on it to be, and then I realized it wasn't the toothbrush that threw me. It was I knew my my little tube of toothpaste was not that full, and I'm like. But he wasn't sure, but you still. Used I, it. No, he told me he did. Eventually, he told me. I, yeah, or, or I believed that he did not. I intentionally didn't say definitively until. <laughs> Because it was so fun. And then, <laughs> then I grabbed it and then I went and ran water on it so he could hear me do that and made some noise and then brought it back to there. I used your toothbrush. <laughs> that rabbit is lost in the woods. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I can bring it right back. That was our trip to South Dakota because I'm 
going a little stir crazy because I haven't been out of the country in over two years, and I just need to have that kind of something going on. Um, Having kids has been a great adventure, but Charles, you're my last one. You're almost 11. It's been like 11 years since we've had a baby. Um, I don't even know how to handle that. Now we have grandkids that are coming along. Charlotte's only a year, two, two years younger than Charles, so it's like the kids are starting to pick up the slack a little bit. But anyway, you, you're right. I'm kind of chasing a rabbit on that. I'm, I'm going to let that, that go there. So um, the actual point, I'm trying to make is that everything about what I do, uh, what I, the life decisions I've made, who I married, where I live, all of it has been because I'm trying to serve God. Um, we were, I got ordained in, I don't know, 90, was it 93? 93. That sounds right. Um, and joined the, the, the ministry team. That was Michael and Fisher and Derek Miller at the time, and I was the third one ordained in Cornerstone Church. Jeremy, turn around. Pull your shirt down. I don't need to see your belly button. <laughs> so... In 93, we had our third baby. That was February of 93. And I got ordained, I think, the end of April of 93. And before that, I had been a deacon in the church for a year or two. Um, uh, And then we moved to Watertown in 94 to help plant a church in Watertown. And that church eventually merged with this one. And uh, I think all of our Watertown people are now officially not here anymore, but except us. Uh, but now we have some new Watertown recruits. Yep. And uh, <laughs> go baby geese. <laughs> because that's our high school mascot is the gosling, which is a baby goose. So Terrible we're scary. <laughs> It's, it's just, yeah, it's just, uh, okay, anyway. Um, I did want to, I, last time I also talked about how children are a blessing from the Lord and how we just decided, you know, despite the fact that we both came from families that had about three kids on, uh, on average on both sides of our families, that, uh, that we were going to let God bless us that we would let him plan our family and that he knew more about that than we do. Um, it's kind of interesting to think about because, you know, if we'd have stopped with three kids, we'd have had three girls. We wouldn't have had Lindsay or John or Eileen or Bruce or Andrew or Kirsten, Stephen, Joshua. Who's next? <laughs> oh, Daniel, <laughs> Timothy, and there was another one after Timothy, I'm pretty sure. Jeremy, and then Charles, right? Can you imagine our family without those guys? I can't, I really can't. Um, so we just said, all right, we're going we're gonna to let God plan our family, and that's the way it is. And uh, if we wind up with a half a dozen kids, awesome. And we, when we were up to five, I remember being on a mission trip down to Costa Rica. We had five kids, and they're like, oh, how many will you have? And I said, I'm going for 20. <laughs> and that was my standard answer for years until we started to get up to like 14 15, and then I was like, that's starting to look like maybe the 20 was my, it's so far out there, I'm going to get them to stop asking me questions about this answer. Um, so we just want as many as God wants us to have, and it's fine. Um, and how did you have all these kids? Like, well, we didn't have them all at once. You know, you get the first few. Sorry, Naomi, I know you've been the tip of the spear for your family. You know what I'm 
I'm going to say here is if you get the first two or three set right, then they can help you with the next ones. And pretty soon you just kind of have your little assembly line. And, and the oldest ones, you know, they maybe take a little more flack on some areas and don't get to do some stuff. But they also get to be the guinea pig and get away with some stuff that maybe... Yeah, no, not, not with you guys? Yeah, you don't know yet, though, do you? Just too young to realize that yet. Right? You haven't seen the things that they're not going to let them, like, Paul get away with. Although Paul's a boy, so he'll probably have a different set of stuff. So John got some of this as well, because I didn't know anything. I had four girls, and then John shows up. <laughs> and... Uh, and so we, we have been pretty stout, pretty pretty strong on this that, you know, not because we're about genetic immortality or we want to have lots of babies just to be different or the Duggars. I don't know how many people have asked me, are you trying to get on TV? Yeah. Um, no, we really don't want to be on TV. We don't really want to be in the fishbowl, but thanks for asking. Jeremy, turn around. Why don't you, actually, why don't you come on up here now since that's twice Sit next to mom. All right, way to go. Thank you. And then, uh, then, I, then what I was reacting to, I have been feeling this way for a couple of months that the Lord's really been kind of hitting this button in my head and in my heart that, man, our culture, our whole nation is becoming anti-child anti-child um, and as a church as a local church we got to make sure we don't become that you know that we are pro-god pro-family pro having kids um, first commandment ever given in the bible is be fruitful and multiply it's never been rescinded it's also before the law if anyone wants to argue that we're set free from the law whatever um, God wants to have family. There's a whole teaching I've done a few times in the church about how having children allows you to reach the next generation. Yes. And how if you, if you do it right, you only reach their generation, but they'll take that vision and reach the next generation by having their family. And the making of disciples starts at home. Mm -hmm. If you're not making disciples with your own kids, assume you have kids, I mean, if, if, you, if you can't, if your own kids aren't going to, let me run it that way. If your own kids don't hear it, and if you're not faithful to start with your own family, then how are you going to ever um, impart to the church or outside your own family? Or it's like, uh, I forgot who said this. If it doesn't work at home, don't export it. Who was that? It's one of the people of destiny, guys. Uh, oh, well, sorry. I'll, you know, I'm going to remember, right, about 4 o'clock this afternoon when I'm out at Menards in the lumberyard, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, it was so-and-so. And, okay, so don't work at home, don't export it. And I think that's a, a valid principle just in general. Uh, if, you, if your finances are a wreck and you constantly can't pay your bills and, and you're committing bankruptcy and... You know, you probably shouldn't be teaching the financial seminars because you, you don't have it figured out yourself. You, you kind of need to have that same kind of thing, right? So I, at one point, I had a whole chart in my head. Um, I'm just going to share with you a summary version of this. In 1990, March 5th, I started my first professional job as a, as a computer programmer. I made $17,000 a year. I got married in October of 89, March of 90, I took out my first real job, okay? Financially, it was exciting. Now, I was making $17,000 a year now at my first real job, which is eight and a quarter an hour. So, I'm, I'm making big money, right? Big money? Big money, no whammies, big bucks, no whammies. Um, and Kathy's working at a daycare center for basically minimum wage. And about two weeks after I started this job, we found out that she was pregnant with our first baby. And we went from having no insurance 
to having a full HMO that covered everything. And with our first baby, I got my first professional job. And our first baby had jaundice and wound up having to go in the neonatal ICU under the Billy Rubin lights. And had we not had insurance, it would have been tens of thousands of dollars. But our insurance covered all of it. We didn't pay a dime for it. It was the hardest feeling there is, bringing your baby home and then taking her back to the hospital. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I don't want to do this. And so there's a story behind that I'm not going to tell right now because it's, it's not relevant to what I'm trying to say and it would just frustrate me to go through it. Um, <laughs> go through it in part and not finish it. Um, then, uh, our, Michelle was born in October of 1990, three days before our wedding anniversary, and about 23 days before her due date, which is why she had the jaundice. Um, less than a year later, our second bouncing baby was born. That was Rachel. She was born in September of 91. And in the interim, uh, we had found a duplex. My brother and I bought a duplex in Madison, and we wound up being able to move into that about a month or two before Rachel was born. So with the second baby, we went into our first um, actual property that we owned. That was, was pretty cool. Also in October, when the same, I don't know it was the same month or the month after Michelle was born, I got a 10% raise after having been in the company only about six months, seven months, something like that. It was only, it was, got me up to 187 for the year. It wasn't a huge actual annual rate, hourly raise, but it was 10%, and I was psyched. Now, there's two things I'm, I want to talk about this morning, and I'm kind of finally done with my introduction and on to my, onto my bobsled run. Jamaica, we got a bobsled team. Um, and there are two things that from, in my life have run, I don't know how you say it, in parallel. They're, they're, all, they're, they're all part of living. As how, do you, how do you segment these things? I don't know that I can. But I've always been a radical since I was, um, even in middle school, high school, about giving. And I would give 10%. And I would, I would give 10% gross. I know that freaks people out. 10% gross, but you've got to pay all this stuff. Yeah, well, okay. But why not? Because I was a radical. Now, the truth is that I have since come to believe that there is no New Testament requirement put on the church to give 10%. I think the actual attitude of the New Testament church is it's all God's. Period. <laughs> you know? And you're accountable as a steward in his house to manage the money under your care. And if that means he says to you, give 10%, give 10%. But don't be a Scrooge about it. Be joyful in doing it. You know? With every, in all things. Now, so that's where I started. I was like, okay, I got the $1,700, and I got paid monthly, so I got paid like a little over $1,000 a month after they took out all the taxes and stuff. And I'd be like, okay, well, I'm going to take out my 170 or whatever the, I forget what the, the monthly number was, but I took 10% of the gross, and I would write my check once a week. And, you know, there was a lot of pressure sometimes, you know, when they passed the offering plate, and I'm like, I get paid once a week or once a month. I give the check once a month. The Bible says, you know, where Paul said, we're going to take up a collection for the saints in Jerusalem. According to what God gives you each week, put some aside so when I come through, it's not a big burden. We just take it all, and I take it to Jerusalem to help with the famine. That's where the idea of a monthly or a weekly collection comes from. But that idea wasn't that you were supposed to tithe. And it, it, it gets... The idea of giving every week, great, but, but it's not the law. And I was, I was following actually kind of what the Bible said, is 
And Kathy worked at the daycare. Then when she got paid, we'd, we'd do a check for that. And, 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 and we just did that. And then I got the raise. And I said, all right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take the raise. And I'm going to take half of it. And I'm going to add it to our budget. And I'm going to take the other half. And I'm going to add it to our giving. And that's what we did. And I did that every time I got a raise for years. And so what that allowed me to do is I'd get a raise, but I'd get a raise, I would increase what we could spend, but I'd also increase what we were giving. Absolute value of the gift and a little bit on the percentage wise too, because I was making this 50-50 split and what we were doing. Kind of ratcheting up the giving, ratcheting up the the thing, and, and then so what else is going on in parallel is we're having the kids. Um, Kathy had a prophecy real early on in our marriage that she was a, v- a very fruitful field that has been. That was on our wedding day, Derek. Was that? I don't think that was our wedding day, but whatever. Um, <laughs> I think that was in Press for True, and Michael came back up and we started doing it at church. That wasn't our wedding day. Um, but maybe. That's not my that's my recollection, but whatever it was, it was still pretty early. Uh, it wasn't like he could look and go, "Wow, you've got 15 kids. Um, you're a very fruitful vine." It's like, yeah, no, it was like it was like zero, <laughs> or maybe one, <laughs> depending on what it was. Uh, and and that's it's definitely proven to be a true word. Um, but then. Um, we didn't have any babies in 1992, but we had one early in 93, uh, February 93, Sarah was born. And, uh, oh, and all, all this time, we keep having people come and live with us. We don't have any extra space, but, you know, we just, one, one gal, she got saved out of a motorcycle gang, and she, she went up coming to live with us for, what, like a year? Yeah. And she was about the same time Sarah was born, and so, anyway. Um, all this excitement's going on. Sarah's born. Our family's starting to grow. We need to get a bigger vehicle than an a Omni. Because <laughs> if you remember the Omni, it's the, the ultimate econo box. <laughs> it, it, you couldn't get three car seats wedged in the back, even if you used like a shoehorn and a, a crowbar. You just, they're just mashed in there. You close the door and one of them would go pop. So we're like, we got to get a bigger vehicle for this, and we're praying, Lord, we got to, we got to do this. And so, like I said, Sarah's on the way, and and uh, we wound up connecting with a guy who had been in our church, um, and I, I could say his name. I'm not going to because I don't know who's listening where and whatever. But he he had been a master's candidate. And pro- I think he got his master's degree in and. Biology it was some kind of biology. He was working with recombinant DNA, and but anyway, uh, Brian is his first name. I, I will tell you that he wound up taking a job as a used car salesman at one point, and we bumped into him and, he, and hey, how's it going? And, and we're talking. And I'm like, yeah, I'm looking for a minivan. He's like, really? Because I got this job. I'm I'm selling used cars, and we have minivans. And he's like, I've got I've got the perfect van for you. He says, the sticker on it's 8900 but you come in, you find me, you tell me that you read this book and got this price for it, and I'll go to my manager. I mean, he's telling, it was like, <laughs> yeah, it's like if you saw The Incredibles, he's like, I'd like to tell you how to do this, but I can't. I can't tell you to go to this room and fill out this. He's given me all of this, so I walk in. I said, hey, Brian, I got this van. I got this documentation. He's like, I'll go talk to my manager. I came out with that van at 5400 bucks. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> He's like, there's a lot of overhead, a lot of slack on the used car lot for some of those vehicles. So I, I, I got the vehicle home. Now, we had, we'd looked at a couple before that, but that one was, we got it basically 40, 40 50% off, almost half off of what the sticker was on the used car lot. So, I mean, I... We were super blessed, yeah. right? And we got this minivan, the third baby, got another raise. 
I'm up to like 22,000 a year, increase our budget, I can pay for the minivan, increase our, <laughs> our, our giving, we're going along. I get ordained after Sarah's born, I get ordained a little bit later, we keep doing this. <coughs> Excuse me, can we edit that out? Here, let me just... All right, I should be back now. And uh, off we go. And then we are looking at a, a little bit different housing arrangement. Uh, Peg has gone on, gotten married, so she, we don't have her living with us anymore. And we, we're looking, and we're like, we're, we're, Kathy's pregnant again. It's 94. Um, baby's due in July. We're moving moving to a, a bigger, a little bit bigger duplex in another part of town. Um, again, my brother and I bought another place, and we're going to kind of, he's got this master, my, you gotta, if you know my brother, he's always working on some way to create residual income. <laughs> and I'm sure eventually he will nail it. Uh, he's super persistent. He's very bright. Um, He's an orthopedic surgeon down in, in Florida now. And when I say he's very bright, he finished uh, pre-med and electrical engineering at Michigan Tech University in four years and was the top German student they'd ever had at that university. Wow. And played intramural hockey and learned how to downhill ski on the, the private ski mountain that they have and traded stocks in the stock market. And on Black Friday from back in like 87 or whatever, he actually lost a couple thousand dollars as a college student. Wow. Okay, he is, he's very bright and he's very, very locked into this stuff. He will find this. Yes, <laughs> so what I'm telling you, I, he's, I, I could, I, the point isn't to list all the stuff he's, he's tried and where he's had some success and not, but, but let me, He's always been this way. He's still this way. <laughs> but this, was the, this is one of the first ones, is rental property. And so we, we were buying duplexes together. And then he was buying some extra ones because he made more money than I did. And he, and he, he worked harder at that stuff, too. And, and, uh, and we were moving to this, this other house. And so we've got it closed on, this other duplex, and we got the everything. And then... Uh, we were, the, the church was meeting at the YMCA West Annex, and, and for a while we were meeting in the basement of uh, uh, another church, Marty Russ Church. Was it Last Day's Praise Center? Was that it? I think that other Pleasant Valley. Praise, it was, it was, anyway, we were on good terms with them, and we needed a space to meet for a while. We were meeting there. Meanwhile, Michael was, had been the pastor in Madison. He, he'd gone to Whitewater to start a church, um, had some initial success. Then things went sideways through no fault of, their own, of his own. Some people slandered us, specifically slandered him and Annie and what they were doing there. Um, and while that got straightened out, the damage was done. Uh, they wound up moving out of Whitewater, coming back up to this area because Annie's folks are from, were from, lived in Wales at the time. And they had a little time there, and Michael and Annie are just, you know, Michael, the, the gifts and call are without repentance. Right. Gifts and call God. And so Michael, driving through Conomwalk, if meets somebody who they knew from somewhere else, and they said, if you start a church, we'll come. And they're like, well, let's start a church because why not? Um, and I'm sure there's a little more to it than that, but enough, close enough for, for the story this morning. And they started this church. Uh, not in this building, obviously. They started it meeting in the, somebody's house. And, and so that's going on at the same time. And uh, so that was in 92 that this church started, or was that Whitewater? But it's right around there. Uh, and then about two years after this church is going, Michael's going through Watertown. He's like, we need to plant a church in Watertown. And he came in, he shared it with, with me and Derek and, and uh, talked to our church. And I, I felt like, I need to go to Watertown and help with this church plant in Watertown. And so even though we were moving 
already to another duplex in Madison in that summer. I had a baby coming. I felt like God said, well, I want you to go to Watertown. So we said, okay, and we moved at the end of June, and then we moved again at the end of August. We moved to Watertown. And in between, we had a baby. <laughs> so when I say something like, you know, where I live and, and, and all this stuff is all because I'm trying to follow God. I'm, I'm not just kind of speaking in, I want it to sound religious or impressive. I mean, we moved twice in one summer and had a baby between the moves. Yeah, and it, it was as bad as it sounds like. <laughs> it was hard. It was hard work. Uh, but we, we pulled it off and then we had, a, now we've got two duplexes that, you know, we're trying to rent and manage and run and do the maintenance on, but now I'm not doing it from in town. Now I'm doing it an hour away, and um, it scarred me. I tell you, I'm scarred for life. I will never be a landlord. <laughs> I don't ever, ever want to do that again, ever, ever, <laughs> ever. <laughs> No, nope, at no point will I ever do that. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, but not yet. Um, so now we've had our fourth baby, and God has put us in a house in Watertown. I have gotten a promotion in management at my work in that same window. Uh, uh, like just a few months before and I'm, I'm driving back and forth to Madison still for work and but God's continued to bless us uh, anyway this, this Peg who had lived with us for a while she and her husband were they were starting to have kids and they needed a minivan and we were still having kids and when you start to count the seats in the minivan and we're counting heads and we're going oh we've got another head um, this is around 95, 96. John was born in December of 95. Um, our first boy. Um, and uh, we needed a new vehicle. And so what we did is we, we shuffled the blue minivan, Dodge Caravan that we'd gotten from the used car guy, we shoveled, we shuffled this to Peg and Graven, and then my dad was buying a new vehicle, and he had an eight-passenger van. And I had, from the time I was like a junior in college, I had had this credit card. It was a General Motors card, and back in the in the early back in the eighties and nineties, they would let you take a certain percent, a certain amount of cash back, and they would put it toward the purchase of a new vehicle. And then it was capped at 500 a year, but it would collect. And then, you, you, and then they had the option to get a gold card, which was $1,000 a year of rebate. Well, I can work numbers. This is one thing I can do. And so I had worked this system for years, and I was up to close to $7,000 of rebate on this wow. thing. And my dad's looking at buying a new car, a new vehicle, and get rid of his van. And I'm like, hey, um, if I put you on my credit card, you can use this credit towards your new vehicle, and then you can sell me your van. How about that? Yeah. And so basically, I wound up with my dad's van, which is an eight-passenger van, um, extended though. It was big. Uh, not as big as the white whale who, that I had for years, but it was the next size below that. And uh, I basically got it for nothing out of pocket. It was great. He got his new vehicle. He got what he wanted. It didn't cost him anything. He got to bless me. We got to bless Peg. Everybody get, gets an upgrade. Yeah. I was thrilled, you know, and then I got this van. And, and then we had, like I said, John was born in 95. And, and, I, and I'm just watching, looking back, and we've been married since 89, so it's only five, six years, right? And we've already got five kids. And I'm looking at it going, wow, God's really blessing us. Because yeah. on paper, on paper, this makes no sense. Yeah. 
you don't have five kids in six years and, and wind up owning half of two duplexes and a house and a van and a car. It doesn't, and, and continue to give at the rate we were giving at, it just doesn't add up. It just doesn't. It doesn't work in anybody's head, except it did work because the Lord blessed us. And so we're like, okay, well, you know, this is, this is working. And then, uh, wow, it just it kept going. And our next one was Eileen, and she was our first at-home baby, yeah. uh, where we had a midwife at home. And, and we had that because we had a horrible experience at the hospital in Watertown. We're like, yep, not doing that again. And uh, we would had pretty good luck with it in Madison, but... No, not, not there. And uh, so we started the thing where we're having babies at home, and that worked really well for us. And, and I continued to go through this. So the end of, the end of 95, okay, let's see if I do this. July 5th of 1995, I was a manager. I was making now 38000 a year. Roughly, I don't remember the exact, and a couple hundred here, or whatever. And we got an announcement that our company, our office in Madison was being closed, that people were being given an opportunity to move to St. Louis to work for the mothership, which had bought our company, um, Citation Computers. And that was it. That was our opportunity. And if not, we would be given severance and a thank you and see you later. And we went down to St. Louis and we looked at it and we prayed and we're like, yeah, no, I don't feel like God's calling us to move to St. Louis. So we said, sorry, we're not going to go. And they went, for me, they were like, well, we kind of need you. <laughs> and I said, I'm not moving to St. Louis. And they said, well, what if we put you on as a contractor? And basically, they did the Dilbert thing, where they laid me off, paid me severance, like $15,000 severance, and then hired me out as a contractor at an hourly rate about double what I'd been making. Wow. And so now I'm making, I don't remember what, what it was, 40 some, 45 an hour, something like that. And I'm hourly, and I bill my own hours, and I can work my own hours, and all I have to do is set up a computer network at my house, which twists my arm, I'll stop, um, <laughs> which I wanted to do anyway. <laughs> and so that's where we are, right? And I'm looking at it going, all right, so now um, I'm making twice as much money. I did the same thing. Now we're given like seven, $800 a month. Um, I work from home primarily. I've been working primarily from home since that September of 95. And I would still go into the office. They decided to slowly wind the office in Madison down over the course of like a year. Um, and then I wound up staying on. And so we got to the end of, they put me originally on a three month contract. We got to the end of the year. And, and uh, some of the people who had previously been working for me were now in charge, and they said, no, we don't need you anymore. And, and the, HR, the uh, HR VP down in St. Louis said, okay, you're sure? And they said, yep, absolutely sure. At which point, the development team that I had been working with before, because I'd, I'd been manager of cust in customer service for a year and a half, um, they're like, uh, can we have them back? And I got immediately snatched up by the uh, development crew that I've been part of for years. Oh my goodness, it's quarter 12, and I'm still just getting. Um, I don't think I want to go part three, so I'm just going to try to wrap this, OK? Um, immediately, they put me on, same contract, same thing, and now I'm, I'm, I'm living as a, an independent contractor who's charging 40 some dollars an hour making double what I'd been making, learned all the tricks about filling out the Schedule C and driving for, driving for dollars. Jonathan knows what I'm talking about here. Keep the, keep the driving records. And, and uh, 
Driving old cars can be profitable. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of how I launched into this thing. Our next baby, as I said, was Eileen. We got a new house. Um, I, I, I honestly, it's quarter to 12. I, I'm not going to go through the rest of my 15 children. But the pattern has been the same. Every time we have another child, um, God has blessed us with something, whether it's a house or a car or a pay raise or something. There's been an actual financial blessing plus the baby, okay. which is the main blessing. And throughout it all, and, and Jake can attest to this, he has access to the records, I have stayed a radical at giving. Um, we've actually finally got some people who give more cash money than me at times. And it's awesome. Um, but I'm not backing off. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm radically it's, it's not a competition. It's between me and God. I'm just saying, look, I'm, I'm on the pastoral staff here. Really, if anything, I should get a salary. I don't. But I don't mind. I really don't mind. I, I'm committed to seeing the vision fulfilled. I, it's my life. And the, the stuff I'm talking about giving here is just the stuff here. That's not the only stuff we give. We support some missionaries. We do other giving around as people have needs. I'm not super big on birthdays and stuff, but man, my kids, they know. If, if they need something, they're going to get something when they need it. I'm going to give gifts that make sense, that are practical, and, and hopefully that's carried on. But, but really, there, there's... If someone were to go through and look at our lives, mine and Kathy's, and say, well, do you really believe in all this stuff? And check our birth records, our financial records, where we, I mean, it'll all back up everything I've said today. Now, I think you should all be there. Everybody who's a Christian, I think you should all be like, everything I can do to see the vision fulfilled, see God's kingdom come on earth, what I, everything I can do to know God, I want to do it. I'm all in. That, uh, living any other way doesn't make sense to me. Having said that, I know there's so many people that don't live, aren't there. Um, so let me, let me leave this as kind of a challenge for you. If the challenge for you has been giving, you're like, well, and I, I, I'm going to tell a couple more anecdotes here. There was somebody in our church, was in our church for a lot of years, who said to me very early on, I really want to support the church, I really want to be able to give, but we just don't have money. We just don't have this, we just don't have that. I'm like, well, you should give what you can. He's like, well, I just can't give anything. Um, maybe I made a mistake. Prop, quite probably, in not challenging that strong, more strongly and more quickly. Um, but they, he never did come around. He never had anything to give for 15 years. You know, $100 over the course of an entire year and, and thought that was pretty amazing. I'd be really impressed. Um, let's just say his, his life has not gone well. Um, family split up, the wife left him, divorce. I don't know. If you heard me talking about it, he, he, he'd laugh it off today. You know, he's not really even serving God, as far as I know. Um, another family that was around, never could give, never, never found a way to, to do this. You know, we, you know, we do all this other stuff. We, we serve, we do whatever in the church. It's like, yeah, kind of. But always seemed to find a way to get to Florida to Disney World every year, but couldn't give. Divorced, train wreck. I'm not saying if you don't give, you're, you're going to be shipwrecked. What I am saying is if you don't give, it tells me your heart isn't committed. And if your heart isn't really all in, um, then you're probably going to wind up <laughs> train wreck. You know, it, it, 
it's not a direct cause. It's like two things that are indications of the same root cause. Um, so practically, yeah, maybe you've got yourself in a situation where you really you don't have any flexibility in your budget to give. Um, can you start small? And I, I remember hearing a, a, a preacher talk about this where he actually gave advice, traveling preacher. He, he had a testimony about this. He says, start with a quarter. Believe God to give a quarter every week. And you, just seriously, if you really can't do it, just start trusting God. Work your faith to believe to give a quarter. Now maybe you're given $10 or whatever, and you want to, you're like, that's not enough. I want to get up, get fired. Believe God to give a little bit more than you've been giving. And do that for a few weeks or months until you've, you've built yourself to the point where you're like, I can do this. Then do it again. Incrementally adjust the number, get it up there until you feel like you're actually doing what God's calling you to do. And he'll, he'll meet your faith. He will. And, and the whole point of me telling the stories about my own life this morning is to give you an illustration. We didn't have Jack. I, I, when we got married, I, I was not employed. I was a part-time employee at Walgreens. I had a degree in mathematics, not in computer science. I had our budget down on a little program on a Commodore 64, a, calc sheet, a, a spreadsheet called Swift Calc. And I had to manage it to the point where we were within $10 for the entire year of what came in and what went out and was projected. And I did that for two years because our budget was that tight. Okay, so when I'm talking about if your budget's really that tight and you need, a, you need something, believe for a quarter. But do it. And don't worry about it. You guys, oh, you don't need a quarter. No, we don't need a quarter. You need to give. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's like the woman with her two pennies. Did the temple need her two pennies? Not really. But who? she's the one Jesus called out and said she gave more than all of these other people did who came with their full ties of mint and spices and everything else. She's like, she gave everything she had. Yeah. Everything she had to live on. Um, it, I, I do the books. Jake does some of the books. If you throw it in the box, Jake will count it and put it in the, in the bank. If you do it through MoGive, I'll wind up entering your name. Whatever. I don't, I don't really care for me. I care for you. Um, if that's what you're struggling with, get it fixed. Get it right with God. Because the, the two things that you can spend your time, you can spend your money, and what you spend those on will tell me what your heart's really committed to. Amen. Okay, so that, that's the, the kind of the wrap on the, the money and babies part. Uh, the vision part, probably just part of the same thing, is like if you don't have a clear vision, um, go to God and get one. You know, for yourself, for your family. If you're not sure what we're doing as a church, pray, ask God. He'll show you. If, if you're not sure, talk to me, talk to Jake. Um, we do know. We're still, we feel like there's things going on. We don't have exactly the how to make it happen. But I think we're pretty clear on the what needs to happen. Um, yeah. I'm going to call that one good. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'll just pray and... We'll wrap it up. Did you have something you wanted to say afterwards? Um, just to remind everybody to come to the Christmas party tomorrow. But I just did that. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jesus. Um, God, I pray that as I remind myself of all of your goodness, and I don't forget all of your blessings, that, and I do this publicly, that you would uh, not just encourage me and encourage Kathy through remembering, but that you'd stir up the whole church here through hearing the stories and, and uh, God, that you'd move us off of our comfort spot out into the, uh, the great unknown and adventure of uh, where you'll show us like you did with Abram. And Lord, I ask you this morning to, to bless us with your presence 
Bless us with your purpose. And God, that we go out of here, uh, if not fully confident in our vision, fully committed to getting fully confident and understanding what it is you've had for us to do and to fulfilling it with all of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen.